Good evening and welcome to our weekly Bible study. We are going to start our study of the Gospel of Mark tonight. We just finished Jeremiah and Lamentation and we will start the Gospel of Mark. So let's just pray and get started. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the writings of Mark. We thank you that he gives us a glimpse into your ministry. Unlike the other Gospels, he just really concentrates on the things that you did. So, Father, we thank you that he allows us to, to see you and to see your activity. And, and Father, that he allows us to, to understand more about you. Father, I just pray that you will reveal to us what you want us to learn through Mark's writings. And thank you again that you've given us your word to study. So, Father, just be alive in our lives and use us for your glory and your honor. And forgive us where we failed you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, um, who was Mark? Let's just start with that. Mark was not an apostle. Sometimes when we're trying to list those 12 disciples, we might want to throw Mark in there. But he was not. Uh, the best assumption by scholars is that he was probably a teenager when Jesus was in the height of his ministry. Mark uh, is also known as John Mark. We, uh, John was his Hebrew name, Mark was his Latin name, and of course they were under, the area of Israel was under Roman domination during the time of Jesus and Mark, and so that was his, um, his Latin name, the, the language of the Romans. Early uh, church historians believe that, that Peter would probably discipled John Mark, that, um, that Mark learned about many of Jesus's uh, activities from him. He probably was with Jesus some because Jesus was in and around Jerusalem and that area and, and Mark was from Jerusalem. But uh, in one place, Peter refers to Mark as his son, of course, meaning his spiritual son. So Peter probably led Mark to Christ. And so that was that close relationship between uh, John Mark and Peter. Some scholars suggest that Mark might be that young man that's mentioned in the 14th chapter of Mark that was in the Garden of Gethsemane the night that Jesus was arrested. It says that there was a young man there with them and that he had on a, a lemon, a lemon, <laughs> a linen cloth, um, and that they, uh, when they grabbed at him, they grabbed his, his linen robe and it came off and that he ran from the garden naked. There's no proof that that was Mark, but it is in Mark's writings, the only place that that's mentioned. Um, the early church in Jerusalem met in Mark's mother's house. So Mark's mother may have been somewhat wealthy. We do know that she had a servant, um, the story of Peter. Peter was in prison in Jerusalem and the angels set him free. And so he went to the house of, of Mark's mother and believers were the, gathered there praying for him, for his safety and for his release from prison. And, and so the servant girl goes to the door and sees Peter and closes the door and runs back in and says, Peter's at the door. And so we know that she had a servant. So that kind of confirms that she may have been pretty well off. Um, that also confirms that uh, Peter could have been very active in Mark's life because Peter was certainly uh, one of the founders of that church in Jerusalem. And so he went, was familiar with uh, Mark's mother's home. And so certainly he played very, probably very much a strong role in Mark's life. Um, one of the stories about John Mark that is probably most familiar to us is the story of his interaction with Paul. Paul and Barnabas are planning Paul's first missionary journey. Uh, and so Barnabas suggests that they take this young believer, John Mark, with them. And they do. And they get about to Cyprus on this journey, and John Mark decides that he wants to go home, back to Jerusalem. Paul is not happy with him, but he does go back to uh, to Jerusalem and, and leaves this missionary journey. Then, as Paul and Barnabas are planning the second missionary journey, Barnabas again suggests taking John Mark with them, and Paul absolutely refuses, and so they get into an argument, and as a result, Paul and Barnabas split. And so Paul takes Silas 
on his second missionary journey. And Barnabas and John Mark go on a missionary journey. And I believe they actually go back to Cyprus where uh, John Mark had kind of jumped ship on that first missionary journey. But we do know that Paul and John Mark uh, do reconcile before it's all said and done because uh, later in Paul's ministry, he writes, uh, I believe he's in Rome when he writes this, and he writes and he says, and bring John Mark with you because he is useful in the ministry. So we do know that um, that Paul, that John Mark earned his way back into Paul's graces with the work that he did. So that's just a little bit of background on Mark or John Mark, as we might call him. A little bit of information just on the Gospels themselves. The four Gospels each record many of the, much of the same information, um, just kind of through a different lens. I heard a really good description of how we could look at the Gospels. This this one person that I listened to, listened to said, reading the Gospels is like watching the same scenes unfold, but through four different cameras. One camera might have a real close-up of the subject that's talking or doing the acting. The other one might have a further away view. The other one might be scanning the crowds and the other one might have the entire scene in its view. And so that's a good way for us to kind of see the perspective of the gospels, even though they cover many of the same events and, and teachings and significant things in Jesus's life they often cover them from a different perspective. So Matthew, for example, is written to the Jews. He, he portrays Jesus as Messiah and King, and he, he gives the genealogy of Jesus, and he goes back to Abraham and takes it through David and then on to Jesus to, to show his, his kingship and, and, um, and, and that he is Messiah. And he focuses more on what Jesus says. He gives us those long... Um, speeches like the the on the mount of olives he gives us those long and in detail in detail stories parables that we have and and other long orations of Jesus where John pretty much establishes Jesus as deity John goes back to Genesis and he says and the word was with God and the word was God in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. And, and then, and he goes back all the way to, um, to Adam for his genealogy. And then there's Luke who's actually writing to, uh, the Gentiles. He writes to Theophilus or Theophilus, what I can, I don't know how his name is pronounced, and, and then to all Gentiles. And, and then he proclaims that salvation through Christ is for all, Jew and Gentile. And his genealogy doesn't come around until after after Jesus' baptism instead of being at the beginning of his gospel. And he gives all 77 generations. Um, so a little per different perspective. And then there's Mark. Mark is the shortest of the gospels. It's the easiest to read. It focuses on the events, on the things that Jesus did in his ministry. Mark begins with Jesus as an adult, where the others go back and pick up his birth or even before his birth with the stories of Mary and Joseph and, and Martha, the, the mother of John the Baptist. And so some believe that Mark may have actually been the first gospel that was written, but there again, we don't have proof of that. Mark is one of the synoptic gospels. Synoptic just simply mean that's Matthew, Mark, and Luke, just meaning that they cover um, many of the same events and they're presented in a, in a similar way. So our lesson today actually begins in the first chapter of Mark in verse 1. And so um, we start with verses 1 through 3. And it says, in the, beginning of the, in the beginning of the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. A voice of one calling out in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord make straight paths for him. Like I said before, Mark does not begin with Jesus' birth or his genealogy. He introduces Jesus as an adult at the beginning of his ministry. and But he, he introduces him as Messiah, as Son of God, 
this brief reminder of the prophecies from Isaiah, and actually it's also in uh, Malachi. And then he moves on to John the Baptist before he really concentrates on Jesus. He introduces this is about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. But then he talks about the prophecy and then about the one who would pave the way for, um, for Jesus. You know, he says, in the beginning, that verse 1 starts, in the beginning of the good news. You know, three times that terminology is used. First, at the creation. In the beginning, God created, you know, the world. And then John uses it at the beginning of his gospel. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. And then here, Mark uses it to pinpoint the beginning of Jesus' ministry. And Mark calls Jesus Messiah, the Son of God. Make no mistake, Mark says, make no mistake who I'm introducing here to you. And he says, the promised one foretold by the prophets, who is the Son of God. You know, Joshua, Yeshua, is another name for Messiah and, and meaning salvation and and in the Greek, I believe the word is for uh, anointed one or appointed one. And so Mark wants us to understand that he is fully God and fully man. And that's so important for us to understand about Jesus because he became one of us in order to lead us into eternity, to be our example. Malachi and Isaiah both would say that there would be one that would come before Messiah to prepare the way for him. And Mark wants his readers to know that Jesus is that one and that John the Baptist is that messenger that was sent to prepare the way. Um, that this was all God's plan and that it was predicted centuries before, but that it, was, it had unfolded right before their eyes. And so then in verses 4 through 8, And so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him, confessing their sins. They were baptized by him in the Jordan River. John wore clothing made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. And this was the message. After me comes the one more powerful than I, the straps of whose sandals I'm not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. So the description here of John the Baptist. John the Baptist was Jesus's cousin. They were about the same age. John the Baptist was just a tiny, just a few months older than Jesus. And I just, it just seems odd that in his description or introduction of John the Baptist, that he throws in that description that John wore clothing made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. So I thought I'd just kind of see what other people said about that and, and, and throw in a little bit of uh, experience also. Um, I just thought it odd that Mark, why did Mark want us to know that about John the Baptist? Well, first, it makes it almost sound like some of those prophets of old. John was the last prophet. There was no need for any more prophets. And so it, it makes him sound like the description of him sounds like those prophets of old. Elijah was said to have had this leather belt. And camel hair was not unusual for wilderness life. As a matter of fact, I've been like to uh, Morocco, to the Sahara Desert, and they use camel hair for their tents. We spent the night in a tent uh, out in the middle of the Sahara Desert, and it gets like freezing below 30 degrees or so at night. And then it's hot, hot in the daytime. And so that camel hair, those tents and that clothing would have been good insulation for those extreme temperatures. Um, another thing, it says that he ate locusts and wild honey. Well, locusts were kosher. If you look back in Leviticus and the Levitical law, locusts were kosher. Um, 
also uh, something that I came across said that the carob pods that grew out in the wilderness were also referred to as wild locusts. But I've always had the impression that he literally ate locusts. It was not uncommon as some of the research that I did for them to eat locusts out in the wilderness. They, they would mash them and make them into more of like a um, mix them with with grains and make them more into a, a patty or a cake. Um, they dried them and they could just carry them with them wherever they went and eat them. So I have always thought that he probably just ate locusts. But anyway, for some reason, Mark threw that in there and so I thought we would cover it. Um, but then let's look, let's go on to this, the the second part of verse 1 where it says, preaching a baptism of repentance for forgiveness of sins. This was a new concept. You know, baptism wasn't of Christian origin. Baptism itself wasn't new. Jesus or John the Baptist didn't invent baptism, but they changed the purpose of baptism. Baptism in, in Judaism, it was when a Gentile wanted to convert to Judaism, there were three things, three requirements that they had to do. They had to be taught the law. This was usually by a scribe who was considered a, an authority in the law. They had to be circumcised. And then they had to go through, had to be immersed in water in this ritual cleansing, uh, this ritual ceremony of purification. And it was a baptism, basically. Uh, Jews did the same thing. They, that act was a frequent act for them uh, to purify themselves. For example, if you came in contact with a leper or if you had a light case of leprosy and by some miracle you were healed and you would go to the priest and the priest would declare you clean, you would have to go, you would have to go, you know, do this ceremonial, this ritual cleansing. Um, if you came in contact with a dead body, like a family member died or something, you would have to go through this, this ritual cleansing. And so baptism, this ritual dipping in the water was not unusual. There were pools. I've, I've been several places in the world where we saw these pools that were for those baptisms, that ritual cleansing of Judaism. But John's baptism was different. His baptism, and they did that to themselves where John was doing the baptizing. But John's baptism, it says, was tied to repentance and tied to the forgiveness of sin. There was nothing ritual about it. It indicated that you had made this confession of sin and that you were ready for a new and, and converted life purified life, not just this body washing to purify you from something that you had been in contact with or something. But the shocking part of all this was that the Jews were coming to do this. They were coming to this baptism. It says the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem. Well, for starters, about the closest would have been 20 miles to go to the Jordan River, up to about 40 miles. And Jesus, from Nazareth, it would have been about 50 miles to the Jordan River. They don't know exactly where where John the Baptist was, was preaching, probably at some crossroads, but at best about 20 miles for them to travel. But why would the Jews do this? And not to mention that it was a hard journey. Jerusalem was much higher. We're talking about the Jordan River Valley, so it was a descent of about 4,000 feet. So it was a pretty hard journey through the Judean hillsides. And so why were Jews coming to this? Why did they need this baptism? They were already Jews. They were already uh, converted. They didn't need converting. I mean, they were already Jews. And so, but they were coming to this repentance to be prepared for Jesus. So this was kind of the shocker, and of course not what the, the priests would have been teaching in the temple. But Jesus would come after John the Baptist, and Jesus would baptize the soul. He would baptize with the Holy Spirit. You know, John is always, always pointing to Jesus. Um, He's in the wilderness, he's preaching, and he's just pointing to Jesus. You know, God's people had quite a history <laughs> about the wilderness with Jesus. They had spent 40 years in the wilderness. Jesus will soon spend 40 days in the wilderness 
and being tempted and, and everything by Satan, but, but God's people had experience in the wilderness with Jesus where they, they learned their need for God. And here, under John's preaching, they're learning their need for forgiveness and their need for repentance. And so we see that. John's baptism was far from those rituals, far from those rituals in Jerusalem and the practices of the temple. He was focusing on their need for repentance and on their need for forgiveness by the only one that would be able to buy that forgiveness. And so, um, again, John always pointing to Jesus. Um, he refers to Jesus and he says, and this is his message. Um, after me comes the one who's more powerful than I am, always pointing to Jesus. And the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. You know, the lowest of the servants dealt with the sandals. The lowest of the servants would have tied the sandals on their master. And John says, I'm lower than the lowest of the servants when it comes to Jesus. I'm just here to proclaim him. He's the one you need to look for. It would have been easy for John to say, oh, yeah, I'm his cousin. <laughs> look at me. I'm his cousin. This great one is coming, and I'm the one that's been chosen to proclaim his coming. I'm the one that gets to, to call out to you and say, here's the fulfillment of the prophecies. John could have easily done that. But no, he was that humble, humble servant who said, I'm not even worthy to untie his sandals. And so then in verses 9 through 13, after that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Just as Jesus was coming out of the water, up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, you are my son whom I love. With you, I am well pleased. And at once the Spirit sent him into the wilderness, and he was in the wilderness forty days, being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals, and the angels attended him. Now we meet Jesus. We've had, we've talked about the prophets, we've talked about John the Baptist, and now in verse 9, in Mark's gospel, we meet Jesus. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth. You know, I think Mark wants us to understand he didn't cover his chi his birth or his childhood or anything about him until this moment. And I think Mark wants us to understand, he says, at that time, Jesus came from Nazareth. That same person, that same Jesus that was born in Bethlehem, whose family went to Egypt because the angel warned them, and then they moved back to Nazareth where he grew up. This is that Jesus that I'm talking about. So he came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan River. And like I said, Jesus would have had to travel something like 50 miles to come and be baptized, but he's fulfilling prophecy. He is being obedient to God in fulfilling prophecy because one crying out in the wilderness would pave the way for him. And so he comes to that one crying out in the wilderness, paving his way. And when he was baptized, it says, when he came up out of the water, heaven was opened and the spirit descended on him like a dove. You know, this is the first time that we just really see the Trinity, the Son, the Spirit, and the Father all gathered here in this one place. Um, Jesus didn't have to be baptized. Jesus was, uh, he was sinless. <laughs> why did he need to be, why did he need to come to repentance and have forgiveness of sin? He was perfect. He was sinless. And yet he comes to the Jordan River. He makes this journey to the Jordan River to this exact location with John to be baptized. And Jesus didn't need repentance. He didn't need forgiveness, but he needed to be obedient to the Father. He needed to be our example. 
And so he did. And when he did, when he comes up out of the water, the heavens open. And it's in in Isaiah, the prophet, I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you a couple of things. In Isaiah 64, 1, the prophet announced that God would rend the heavens like he would like the the when we hear on the cross the 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 temple curtains were rent. Well, this was rending heaven. This was opening heaven. And um and it said the prophet announced that God would rend the heavens. And Isaiah's prayer was that God would come down and reside with humanity. God had answered Isaiah's prayer and he had fulfilled that prophecy. And John, uh, Mark uses the term next or whatever the, the Greek term was for that, but he uses that some 40 times. You know, when you're telling the story and you say, and then, and then, and then, and that's kind of the way Mark writes, and next, and then. And so the Holy, and then the Holy Spirit descended like a dove. The Spirit of God came down from heaven and descended on Jesus at that moment. Not only did he descend on him, he empowered him. He's about to go into the wilderness and face temptation by Satan. The Spirit empowered Jesus. And then, <laughs> and then God spoke from heaven. The third part of that trinity, God spoke from heaven and said, you are my son. You are my son and I love you and I'm pleased with you. This pinpointing of the beginning of Jesus's ministry, this bringing together the one who cried out in the wilderness, and then bringing the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit together as one. Jesus being obedient. And then the scripture says that he, this same Spirit, this same Spirit sent him into the wilderness and he was in the wilderness for 40 days being tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild angel, animals and the angels attended him. It says that the terminology here, that he was with the animals, but it wasn't like a fear, that he was alongside with the animals. You know, Jesus was the creator of those animals. He had nothing to fear from them. And he had nothing to fear from Satan. He was empowered it wasn't easy. He, he was hungry. He was tired. But the angels ministered to him. So what do we learn? What, is, what do we get from Mark's lesson today? Uh, Mark is much more concise. He's easier to read, much easier than Matthew or Luke. Uh, I, I really like Mark and John. They're my favorite gospels. But he gets immediately to the point of everything that he tells us. He just blurts it out like he can't hardly wait, almost like a younger, more experienced writer. And Jesus is the one that he says he is. Jesus is who he says he is. And Mark proclaims that early on. The prophets foretold Jesus. God confirmed him. John announced him. So the prophets foretold him, John announced him, and then God confirmed him and the Spirit empowered him. The obedience of Jesus is shown already just in these first 13 verses. He, he was obedient to God's will. He didn't need to be baptized, but he did as our example. He was sinless. He was obedient to, to do as the Spirit commanded him to go into the, into the wilderness and to be tempted by Satan. And Mark clearly, clearly shows us what the Bible never uses the term Trinity, but he clearly shows us the three parts of God, the Son, the Father, and the Holy Spirit. And then I love the part where it says, you are my son, and I love you, and I'm pleased with you. You know, Jesus wanted to please God. And if we don't learn anything else from this lesson, I think that we should learn that we should want to please God. Just as Jesus pleased God, so should we in our lives. Thank you.